All right. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all today. Um, thank you all for keeping us in prayer uh, as our youth group was in Mexico last week. Uh, we had a fantastic time. Um, we got to share last night after our church potluck. If you were unable to make it, um, the sharing is up on our YouTube channel, so you can uh, take a look. If you just put in CCICSV into our uh, into the YouTube feed, you can hear people sharing from last night. And so we'll be talking a little bit about our trip and how it actually relates to our passage this morning. Um, if you've been with us, we have been in a series in the Gospel of Mark for some time. And uh, as you know, usually I'll have one of you come up here and read the passage. Um, I want to do something a little different this morning. Um, I want you, as we read the passage, I actually want you to close your eyes so you can just hear the story being told. This is one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible, um, and especially in the book of Mark. But let's all close our eyes and just listen to the words that, um, that Mark writes. This is Mark chapter 6, verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized him, and ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and they said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 God's word. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you communicate your goodness, your power, and what you would, uh, how would you want us to follow you all through the word. So God, I pray that as we think about what, um, what we've just heard this morning, that we would have open minds and open hearts to what you want to say to us through your word this morning. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Um, for those of you who have been around our youth group for some time, we haven't done this recently, but on many Friday nights, we have been watching a TV show called The Chosen. And if you're unfamiliar with The Chosen, it is a crowdsourced um, film a series that uh, has been made uh, just to retell the story of Jesus. And so they are now on, according to my film expert, Jeremiah, who's back there, um, we are now on season four. Um, We've watched the first three seasons as a youth group on Fridays over the course of the last several years. Um, I haven't seen a lick of, of season four yet. Uh, as soon as um, I get back from several trips coming up, that's when I'm going to start and I'm going to uh, just binge watch all eight episodes of season four. Because I love, I love how the show has depicted what is happening um, in the life of Jesus and the life of the disciples. And so each week, just so I could kind of preview what we would watch with the youth group, I would always watch beforehand because we would have discussion questions and I would want to know what the episode was about. And when we watched, this was the season finale of episode three. And so Thursday afternoon, the day before youth group, when I was watching this, and watching a visual depiction of what we just read, sitting at my desk, watching on my computer, my nice desktop computer built by Enoch, and I was bawling my eyes out. Just like tears like coming down my face as soon as I saw like all of the food being distributed. And if you've grown up in church, you've heard this story before, but something about seeing it depicted visually just made me just kind of hit like all of my emotions watching it. That's why this morning I wanted us to have our heads bowed so we could kind of just take in what Mark has to say. Um, 
And so a couple weeks back, we were talking about when Jesus visits his hometown. And uh, because of the familiarity people have with Jesus, he's doing some miracles, but no one recognizes him uh, for who he is, the powerful son of God. And it poses the question, why don't we experience miracles like we just read today? And as much as I was sitting there at my computer, just bawling my eyes out, it's funny, because after the sharing last night, someone asked me, Dan, did you cry this year on the Mexico trip? And uh, as many of you know, uh, one of my great friends, Derek, uh, who helps us out on Friday nights with the youth group, he just loves it when people cry, like happy tears. It's like his most favorite thing in the world. And so um, someone asked me, like, Dan, did you cry this year? And no, but I'm going to tell you a story of someone else on the team who cried this year. And she's not here, so I can talk about her but, um, later on. But I would say in a, much, in a way that we might deem smaller than what we just read, I would say our team got to experience something very miraculous. And when we define it based on, I think, what we're learning from Jesus, like I'm very excited to share that story with you, but also to help us see how that pertains to our lives as disciples. Um, if you've been with us, we have been, uh, some of the themes we've seen, so will be up on the screen in a moment. Um, the two main themes we've seen in the Gospel of Mark is that Jesus is the powerful Son of God. I'll explain some uh, some examples of that in a moment. But secondly, that the Son of God is worth following. Both things are on full display in the passage that we just read. Um, over the last couple of chapters, we have seen that Jesus is Lord over the storm. He calms a giant storm that the disciples are in, in a boat. Um, he is Lord over the supernatural. He meets a man who's demon-possessed and casts out the demons, and the man's life is changed. He's Lord over the sick and the lame. We've seen this when Jairus' daughter is very sick, actually dies, and Jesus brings her back to life. And the woman who had a bleeding condition for probably more than a decade is healed the moment she touches Jesus' cloak. These are all examples of what it means that Jesus is the powerful Son of God. And then last time we also saw that Jesus, in his own hometown, he faces rejection, and he helps the disciples see that they're going to experience rejection as a part of uh, being his students and being his disciples. And then we see the death of John the Baptist, who ultimately faced uh, the kind of the greatest uh, example of rejection when he is killed because of his faith. And so in this passage that we read, and we're going to read a little bit more after it, but the verses that we read, um, we're going to focus on two discipleship principles this morning, and then we're going to end with a question that I think is important for all of us to ask ourselves when it comes to discipleship. So that's our structure for this morning, two discipleship principles that we'll get into once we start going verse by verse, and we'll ask a question at the end. So let's start from the verses we read. Uh, starting in verse 30, we see um, the apostles had been out teaching. Remember, Jesus had sent them out. He had given them instructions. He said, prepare to face some rejection. Don't take a lot of items with you, etc., etc. We saw that last time. So they come back, and they tell Jesus what, what they had done. And so they were in... in at this moment, they're in a moment of rest. And so verses 30 to 32 kind of just give us the setting of the disciples coming back and sharing with Jesus what's happened and finding some rest. And then uh, once we get into verse 33, we see the start of the scene of where this giant crowd came from. And so many people recognize Jesus and the disciples, and that's how this giant crowd comes. And so um, Jesus, when he sees them in verse 34, it says something really powerful that teaches us about the heart of Jesus. When Jesus saw them, he had compassion on them because he saw that they were sheep without a shepherd. In other words, he saw all of these people who were coming to hear Jesus teach or maybe from their perspective, hopefully seeing or viewing some kind of miracle. Jesus recognized that they need a savior. There is something missing in their lives and he has compassion for them. And that's why he starts to teach. And the people are so eager to hear what he has to say. So Jesus is teaching all day, right? Now for us in a smartphone generation, if I talk more than 35 minutes, I just lose you all, right? And so, but these guys, they're listening all day. And they're, it's starting to get late. Day's starting to turn to night. And they must be hungry. And so then in verse 35, it, sh it tells us that the disciples came to him and they kind of recognized the situation. And they say, they're essentially saying, Jesus, like, we're out in the middle of nowhere. This preaching has been like, this is like a, like, you know, it's like a concert out in the woods where there's no food around. And like, you know, these people must be super hungry. Where's the food going to come from? And before we go too deep into what happens, 
Um, I think this is act this actually gives us our first discipleship principle in the passage. That's really important. It's a small detail, but I actually think it's important for us to understand. The disciples see what's going on, and they recognize the people are going to need food, right? It's been a long day, and so they notice that there's a need. Jesus has been teaching all day. The people have got to be getting hungry. Their homes are more than a walking distance away. And so they ask Jesus, they say, uh, send, in verse 36, send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. In other words, they're saying, Jesus, you've been teaching all day. It's awesome, but the people got to be hungry, right? Like, you got to give them a chance to eat. Maybe they need to get up and leave now. Um, depending on commentaries that you read, they kind of speculate on how far out in the countryside they were, how plausible this was. Were they really close enough where they were going to get food in the chosen episode, whether this was real or not? Uh, they start to question whether the people can even make it home because they're so tired and the, the journey could be far. They might faint from hunger. And so the disciples have in their mind a, a bunch of different ways that maybe they can get these people fed. But I don't want us to skip over the fact that the disciples see the people and this is where they are similar to Jesus in this moment. Jesus saw the crowds at the beginning of the day, and he saw them with compassion. And he said they need to be taught. And that's why the day goes the way it does. And at the end of the day, the disciples, through wanting to care for the people, they're, they're realizing, hey, these people are hungry. They've been here all day, like faithfully listening to Jesus. How are we going to feed all of these people? You know, when we prepare for the Mexico trip, um, if you haven't gone before, or if your parents, if the parents are someone who their kid hasn't gone before, one of the main questions is, well, what are you going to eat for a week? Because they want to know that their kids are going to be taken, taken very good care of. Um, some of you guys are laughing because, you know, we eat probably about as good as you possibly can if you've been on this trip, right? But it just goes to show the disciples see a human need that these people have. They recognize that there's a need around them. And so before we go too, too much farther, we need to pause here and realize part of being a disciple of Jesus is recognizing needs that are around you. And I think it's darn near impossible in American culture, in Silicon Valley life, where we are so focused on our work, where we are so focused on our grades, our future career, what school we want to go into, we are trained through no fault of our own. Well, I think we, you know, maybe we have some agency in it. But we live in an environment where we are taught to look out only for our own needs. And while the disciples must have had a ton of doubt in, you know, we read the whole passage about how this whole event was going to go down, it shows that they did recognize the physical needs of people around them. And so a question that we want to start uh, to ask ourselves when we think about this is, are we so consumed in our own individual lives that we can't see needs of people around us, whether they be material or maybe spiritual or emotional or whatever it is? And this teaches us that part of being a disciple of Jesus is caring about the needs around us. And the disciples see this is actually going to be a big problem. At the end of the passage, it says 5,000 men. So it's the tagline in your Bibles, if you have the headings, is the feeding of the 5,000. There's no way it was 5,000. It had to be way more than that, probably closer to 10,000, because it said 5,000 men. There's got to be women there. There's got to be children. And so people speculate on what the total number is. But either way, and we'll get there in the, the, the denarii amount. It's kind of fascinating when you do the calculations. They see there's about five digits of people that are hungry. And we're like 11 or 12 of us. I can't remember if they've gotten all 12 by now. It's a small group of Jesus' disciples, and they feel responsible to feed them. And before we go further, I want to say that's a good thing. They want to see that the people are taken care of. It's like when I, any time I visit my parents or I visit my grandma, it doesn't matter what time of day it is, the first thing that happens when I come through the door is I give them a hug, and then they say, are you hungry? And if, you, uh, if, you, you know, if you've lived away from your parents for some time, that's probably one of the first things that your parents ask you. And from a parent's perspective, you always want to make sure that your kids are, are fed well, right? It could be 5 o'clock. I can be like, oh, no, Grandma, I'm fine. I just stopped at Chick-fil-A on the way here. Like, I'm totally stuffed. And she'll be like, okay, well, let's get you some food, just because that's the kind of care that she wants to show for me, right? And so we see that the disciples recognize the need. So that's something the disciples do really well. And I think when we consider how challenging this situation must have been for the disciples, 
We have a tendency to think the disciples were filled with doubt and they, you know, maybe they don't don't quite get it. And Mark's actually going to be pretty hard on the disciples later in this chapter. But in this moment, they're getting something right. It's one of the things they do really well here where they see the physical need and they want to meet it. And I think that's something really important that we can learn from. And so I'm thankful that we get to go to Mexico every year. I've been on this trip countless times But it always reminds me that when we get to travel to Viva Piedra Church, the church we've gone to for uh, just about 10 years now, every time we go down there, it's in a super poor community. And we need the reminder of the physical needs that we can help people with when we go on this trip. And it teaches us not to take for granted what God has blessed us with living here. And so that's a good lesson for us. So the disciples see the, the need that's here. And so that's an important question for us. Do we notice the needs of those around us? So the disciples are trying to figure out a solution here to get all these people fed. And so um, in verse 37, there's something really powerful that we'll come back to. But as they're, as they're thinking about how to get them fed, Jesus says something very strange and peculiar, but very powerful. Like they're coming up with ideas. They need to go home. Where's the nearest village? Where's the food? And Jesus says, no. You give them something to eat. Now, imagine being a disciple in that situation. Like, if you're on lunch duty at our church, and, like, you're making the plates, and then someone peeks out, and you see the long line, it's like, oh, we got to get a move on, because the line's coming through, and, like, we're, like, behind here, right? Imagine being, like, one of 12, and you have five loaves of bread and two fish, and there's a crowd of 10,000 people you're trying to feed, and Jesus says, you give them something to eat. That's crazy. Be like, Jesus, what are you talking about? We'll get into that in a moment. But the disciples probably, I think they almost don't even hear what Jesus has to say because they're still like trying to figure out, okay, what's the solution? Verse 37, uh, Jesus says, give them something to eat. And they say, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? Now, culturally, let's understand what's going on here. Uh, One denarius is considered a day's wage right? So roughly when you calculate this out, it becomes like kind of like just under like a year's salary. So I was doing some calculations. I was like, say, let's not say there's 10,000. Let's not say there's double the amount of women and children. Let's say there's like roughly 8,000 people there. And uh, if, you know, if 200 denarii represents roughly one year's salary, like let's say they're a software engineer, you know, in Silicon Valley and they're making like a cool 100K. If you do the division, it's like, we're talking about like $12, $13 a head. That's like a normal lunch price in today's society. Nothing special. Like if you want to go out to eat somewhere good, $12, $13 doesn't get you anything in Silicon Valley anymore. So even today, it's amazing how inflation still kind of like, like matches up with what we see here. But it's basically like the disciples are thinking, if we can go and find 200 denarii, then we can buy like a normal meal for everyone. And then never mind how you might do like distribution of everything. Jesus has thought of that, the distribution even. It's fascinating, right? And so verse 38, he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they had found out, they said five and two fish. If you've read other gospel accounts, you might remember that there's a boy. It's like his lunch, right? And he brings it. That's not in the gospel of Mark. I don't think that's Mark's uh, priority to tell us about that. But in other gospel accounts, you might see that. But it, Mark's focus here is just to say how much food there is, and that's it. And so then Jesus, in verse 39, he commands them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. They sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. So for the five loaves and two fish, they're like arranged in groups of fifties and hundreds. Like Jesus has even thought of like crowd control and like logistics and everything. And he's planned this out really well, right? And so that's what's going on. And then he takes the little amount of food that's there, and he prays for it, and the disciples start passing it out, and everyone eats. And there's, an, there's actually 12 back, baskets full left over. Um, I don't want to spoil how it goes in The Chosen, because I want you all to watch it, but it's pretty cool how they do this part, which is probably why like, I was sitting there with, uh, with tears in my eyes, right? And so I want to go back and look, zoom out and look at this kind of situation as a whole. In verse 37, when the disciples are freaking out and they want to know, how are we going to get these people fed? Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And I've already said why that would be such a troubling statement for the disciples, right? Jesus, we have seven food items and five digits of people, like high fours or low five digits of amount of people. 
What are you even talking about right now? How are we going to get this done? Even if 10 people shared like a loaf of bread, and even if 10 people shared each of the fish, that's like only 70 people who are eating a small amount of food. There's still like thousands of people who would not have any food. How does this happen? And I can imagine being one of the disciples in this moment and saying, Jesus, it is not enough. It's not enough. How can we feed them? I don't have enough. And what Mark is trying to show us is that sometimes when we say, Jesus, I don't have enough, that is not a problem for Jesus because he's the powerful son of God. Um, I alluded to something powerful that happened on our Mexico trip. Uh, some of our Mexico team members may have uh, witnessed this and maybe they were like, damn, what are you talking about? I don't remember anything powerful. Um, hopefully they would, but we were split into two teams this year when we were on outreach. We had 34 people. You can't take 34 people anywhere. It's too complicated. So they split us into two groups. And the other team led by Tammy, uh, they, were, um, they went to go visit a men's rehab center. And there was a schedule miscommunication where we thought our team would be there all day but they had other plans uh, at their center for after 12. So our team was only there for about two hours. And so after that, with a whole free afternoon, uh, not knowing what to do, uh, the YWAM, one of the YWAM leaders, YWAM's the organization we went with, as they're sitting on the bus, he had the team pray for like, what God would want them to do for the rest of the day. And some, usually when we finish ministry early on this trip, what happens is we'll just stay in that area and we might go door to door and just ask people if we can pray for them. Um, Purple team, if I get any of the details wrong, correct me later and we'll do like a, you know, we'll do a correction thing later. But I think I have the general gist of what happened. And so um, it was amazing because in getting off the bus, there were already people coming up to the team, like looking for someone to talk to. And you guys got to pray for them, right? I'm doing, Daniel's doing this. Okay. All this to say, I know our team well. I tried to prepare them for what like street evangelism in Mexico is like. But for many of our students, I said, hey, how comfortable are you if someone calls on you like in a moment to just pray for someone? And like the looks I got was like shock and mortification. And like there's, there's, there's three boys where I'm just like, they usually dress similar where I'm like, okay, if I need to call on someone, I know I've got the three that, uh, why are you turning your head right now? That I could call on to pray for something because I know they feel comfortable praying out loud. But for most people to be put on the spot to pray for someone is like very, a very challenging thing. We feel self-conscious. And even though this is a big part of YWAM's culture, it's not necessarily a part of our culture. I kind of wish it was. Maybe we can get there at some point. But I can imagine for the group, as they're meeting with a complete stranger, if someone says, hey, you're going to pray, I can imagine at least thinking the thoughts from the perspective of a team member. But my words aren't eloquent enough. I haven't done this before. I'm so worried about what other people might think about what I'm going to say or how my prayer is going to go. It's the same thing as saying, Jesus, I don't have enough food. We're saying, I don't have the ability. I don't have the experience. I don't have the spiritual maturity or whatever it is to say, like, I can pray for this person. And so shout out to my sister, Elaine, who's not here. So we're going to talk about her. But in the group that she was in, she just immediately was praying for the woman. Maybe not immediately. You guys could correct me on the details later, but I've got enough of it correct that it works, okay? So anyway, I, what I was told and what I saw pictures of, and you might have, you might have missed it in the sharing because Uncle Darson was describing this in the sharing last night, and uh, he was speaking in Chinese, and he was mispronouncing Elaine's name. He was calling her Eileen, so you might have missed some of it, but that's neither here nor there. But in the picture, you can kind of see her face looks a little bit moist. I've never heard homegirl pray out loud before. I haven't. But in that moment, no prayer experience or anything did not stop her from being willing to pray for a complete stranger with tears starting to form coming down her face. And that's because sometimes when we believe, Jesus, what I have is not enough, Jesus says, I will make it enough. And that's what happens here when the 5,000 are fed. And that gets us to the second discipleship principle that's super important for us if we're followers of Jesus. 
And it's simply that Jesus' disciples will do what he asks. And in this moment, whether she was properly trained or not, and you could blame a lot of that on me, honestly, in this moment, Elaine was willing to say yes when she got called on to pray. Was she assigned to do this? Yeah, Silas just pointed, right? Or was it Kenya? Or One of the YWAM leaders said, you're going to pray for her. I don't know if there was hesitation or not, but to me, it doesn't matter. When I heard she was praying for this woman, with tears down her face, that was the closest I got to crying on this trip. Usually, I do cry on this trip, but it didn't happen. But hearing about it made me wish for a moment that I was there to witness it because I thought, what a powerful experience of maybe like us being able to hear her pray for the first time like for someone here who's clearly in need. It's an amazing thing. And so the second discipleship principle that we see here is I am sure, I am so sure the disciples were doubting how this was going to work. And if I could put myself in the disciples' shoes, I'd be like, they'd be, if Jesus said, give them something to eat, I'd be like, give them what to eat? We don't have anything. What are we talking about right now? But somehow, over the course of this story, you see how the disciples organized themselves, took the food out, came back with the baskets, and there was more to spare. And that's because when we do what Jesus says, we may not feel like we have enough. We may not feel like we have anything. And Jesus says, I will show you how I will make it enough. Because that's who our God is. And so the disciples do what Jesus says here. I don't mean to single out Elaine only. There were many of you that prayed for people during the street evangelism, and it was a really wonderful experience for our team. That wasn't the only day that it happened. Um, the only I just made the connection from the tears because I thought of myself watching this with tears streaming down my face. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, this might have been this trip might have been the first time that many of our team members have actually prayed out loud. And so the, the doubt or the worry of like, I don't know how to pray out loud. Like I can pray in the quietness of my own heart, but I've never done this before. I feel inadequate. And Jesus says, I will make it enough. Certainly it's the first time that I think many of us have prayed for a complete stranger on this trip. And certainly many of us must have been feeling like, I don't know how to do this. And Jesus is saying, let me do it through you. And Jesus says, if you do what I ask, it will be enough. And so in this moment, our team did what the YWAM leaders asked them to do on this afternoon in going out and praying for people around that, that immediate area. And God worked very powerfully. I asked a couple weeks ago, like, I brought up the question that people ask me, like, why don't we see miracles uh, like we see in the Bible? I've never seen like 5,000 people be miraculously fed in the way that we're seeing this. But time and time again, there are small things that happen that are nothing short of miraculous if we are looking for it. And I believe that's something that our team got to experience on this trip. So I want to finish with a question that comes from the next couple of chapters. And it's kind of also been my own personal reflection um, from what I learned and experienced on this trip. So after this is all over, we see a very powerful experience, and we're going to see two reactions to Jesus after all of this goes down. So let's read in verse 45. It says, immediately he, he is Jesus, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when, he saw the, when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Um, powerful story. I'm not going to say a ton about it, um, because actually compared to the other gospel writers, Mark says less. Um, in other accounts, there's Peter walking on water, right? We've already seen Jesus calm the storm once back in chapter 4, and so at a minimum, there had to be two like boat experiences with Jesus and the disciples if you're syncing Mark up with the other Gospels. 
And so most likely this is the time when Peter had his stepping out in faith and walking on the water, but Mark doesn't actually record that here. And so in this passage, it just goes to show that Jesus does another powerful miracle right in front of them as the disciples are in need. And it puzzled me reading this this week because I was like, why does it end this way? So they, they've been worked through powerfully by passing out food to like maybe 10,000 people. And then they get in a boat and there's this dangerous storm and Jesus says, don't worry, I'm here, I've got this. And the storm is calmed. And it ends where it says their hearts are hardened. And some of it, the reason that's given is they still didn't understand how he performed the miracle when he fed the 5,000. And so throughout the Gospels, not just in Mark, you see kind of a faith picture of the disciples where sometimes they're getting it and then sometimes they're doubting. Sometimes they're getting it, sometimes they're doubting. It's up and down, it's up and down. Even if you just look at the life of Peter, who would have been a close acquaintance of Mark, who's writing this. You look at Peter. One minute, he's the first person who proclaims Jesus as Christ. We'll get there a couple of chapters later. And then in the next moment, Jesus rebukes him because Peter says he, Jesus cannot die. Jesus actually says, get behind me, Satan. He invokes the name of Satan. So it's like highs, lows, highs, lows with Peter. At the moment Jesus needed him the most, he runs away and denies even knowing Jesus. Highs and lows. Moments of incredible discipleship and then moments of really big doubt, right? And so that's what's happening here. The disciples, they've had a day. I mean, I can't imagine being a part of this. And then, like, right after it, you, you like, experience this big storm. And for many years of following Jesus, I could tell you sometimes that's what life is like following Jesus. You can go from one big powerful event to one big trial the next moment. And all of it is meant to, for us to see, like, how strong our faith is and what we're going to believe in. And so it's really fascinating that they end up from this day where their hearts are hardened and their hearts are doubting. Um, I was reflecting on this because as I'm trying to kind of process a lot of the things I experienced on this Mexico trip, um, I enjoyed the evangelism part more than I ever have in past years. And I would say as a believer in Jesus, evangelism is one of, if not like my weakest points of my, my relationship with God. And... Um, if you've been on this trip before, or if you're considering it, uh, let me give you some full context. YWAM Ensenada is often described as an extrovert's dream and an introvert's nightmare because there's just so many loud, passionate people around. So if you're someone who likes a lot of alone time, um, either think twice about coming with us or we'll come up with some strategy so you can experience that because it's difficult. But anyway, here's a secret about me that you may not know. You know that I am terribly extroverted I don't like talking to new people. Like, I don't. I will talk to people that I know that I'm good friends with, and like, I'm the opposite of our previous pastor. Like, when Fred Mock was here, our welcoming team ministry was like off the chain because like he loves talking to new people. He'd be like chasing people to their cars in the parking lot, and like people are just running to get away from him because he couldn't get enough of it. I, that's not me. That's not how God created me. Now, I recognize how important it is. And it's something that I will do because I know that it's important for people to feel welcomed, for people to feel plugged in when they come to our church. I don't love talking to new people. And I certainly don't love talking to strangers if I feel like I'm going to offend them about the gospel. But on the street evangelism day, which part of me is always feeling somewhat nervous about, it was just such a fantastic time of learning from our translator, Marcos, who took us out to do street evangelism. I had so many amazing conversations with him about ways that evangel... He's from San Diego, but he's ethnically Mexican, so he speaks English and Spanish. He understands both cultures. And we just had some really great conversations about what evangelism looks like in America versus uh, in, in, in Mexico, because the cultures are so different. And I realized when I go on this trip, there's always some big, like, kind of spiritual, like, I don't know, like epiphany that I have while I'm there or some experience that I'm tremendously encouraged by. And I realize that usually without fail, every time I come home from this trip, it might be a day, it might be a week, it might be two weeks, it might be a month. At some point after this trip, my heart gets hardened too. And I forget what's most important. And I can just go about my daily life just going through the motions and thinking about my to-do list, but not actually believing that God can like kind of helped me experience the powerful things that we did in Mexico for a week. 
So if you went on this trip, my encouragement to you is don't just go back to normal life after this trip. Don't just let this be a one-week time where we're talking to strangers and getting out of our comfort zones and experiencing God's power, and then we're right back to staring at our phones for the rest of the next year until maybe we go back again. I don't know how many times like my heart gets hardened during the year in between trips, but I know it's more than one. And so I think that's an important lesson that God wanted me to think about as I'm reading about this. In the same way the disciples had some powerful experiences, don't let your hearts be hardened. And if that's an encouragement for us, then what are we supposed to do? And let's finish the chapter then in verse 53. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. And so what we see here is a totally different response to Jesus from people who recognize that they're in need. And I think Mark puts these two passages back to back where the disciples have powerful experience number two, one after another, and then still end up with hardened hearts versus people who are just running to Jesus to be close to him, to have their lives changed. And so it's two different responses that we can have as a, as a disciple. And so the question I want to leave us with when we finish this chapter is, are, are our hearts hardened by something in the way it was for the disciples? Or are we, like the people in the last passage, running to Jesus and wanting to experience his goodness every day? And I think that's an important question for us all to ponder. Now, if you, like me, can have a hardened heart, as I'm describing, as I'm being, I would say I'm being as hard as Mark is on the disciples. I'm not being extra hard on them. When you look at Peter's life throughout the Gospels, you see it go up and down and up and down and up and down. And sometimes that can mark our Christian lives. And we might think, well, I'm going to have a hard heart sometimes, and then God will lead me out of that season, and something else will happen, and I'll just go back and forth, and God's gracious, right? Like, you know, he still loves me, so I'll just do the best I can. If you read about Peter's life in the book of Acts, there's not a whole lot of up and down anymore. Once the Holy Spirit comes into his life, he goes from doubts and belief and doubts and belief to a really incredibly powerful Christian life. And I believe that all of us can experience that even today. I do. I really believe that. But we have to ask ourselves the questions. Do we have hardened hearts? Or daily, are we running to Jesus? And part of that is asking ourselves, what is my priority in my life? If my priority in my life is my to-do list at my work or what I have to study this day, obviously those are important things. I'm not saying don't do them. But if our priority is the kingdom of God, then I think we can have these types of experiences way more than we have now. And I know I don't want to wait another 51 weeks till Mexico next year to experience these same things. I believe God wants us to experience these things here. And that's why we got to ask ourselves this question. When you think about the principles we learned, that there's a need around us, and that a disciple does what Jesus asks, Jesus is the ultimate example of being obedient to what his father wanted. He saw the human condition, not just a field of 10,000 people, but he saw us as humanity, that there was a need. And he was obedient to what his father asked him to do. And because he was, he died on the cross so that we could know the living God. He's the ultimate example of what it means to be a follower of God. And if you remember, the night before, Jesus is in the garden and he's praying and the human side of him is saying, God, if there's another way, take this cup from me so that I don't have to go through this difficult thing. But because it was what God wanted him to do, he was obedient, he gave his life, and that's the only reason that all of us are sitting in this room right now, worshiping God as the body of Christ. And so Jesus is the ultimate example of what it means to listen to the voice of God and look at the benefit of that. And so when we are obedient to God's voice, then we will experience the same kind of power that I think our team experienced in Mexico and that I know God wants to experience, us to experience here in our daily lives. 
And I pray that that would be something that we are honest about in our lives. Do I want to experience the power of God? Am I being obedient to what God is calling me to do? Because when we are, the outcome is like what we read. It's like what our, it's like what our team experienced in Mexico, and I believe we can experience that here today. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truths that it teaches us. God, I know many times when we consider what you might be calling us to do, we have our doubts. God, I know there are many times when we want to serve you, we think, God, I'm not ready. I don't know how to do it. I'm not enough. And God, I thank you that we could read from your word the truth that when we are obedient, God, that you make it enough. And I pray that we would have that experience in our lives. As we sing this last song this morning, can we praise you for who you are? God, can we be thankful for the love that, is, that you have poured into our lives because of what you've done for us on the cross? And God, I pray that that would lead us to ask the question, God, how can I follow you this day? How can I follow you, follow you tomorrow on Monday and all, throughout the rest of our lives? How can, God, how can we experience this power over and over again? How can we help people experience your love? And I pray that that would be something that we are asking you day in and day out. Lord, would we not wait till the next retreat, till the next big event, to the next big epiphany that you give us, but God, would we strive to follow you right now in this moment. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.